the Columbia Broadcasting System presents Norman Corwin's One World Flight. Listening to So Shen, one of China's most popular actresses, singing a folk song called Su Ji Shang Su, or Love in Four Seasons. This is one among several voices and sounds recorded inside China to be heard tonight on this ninth of a series of 13 broadcasts based upon Norman Corwin's recent global tour as first winner of the Wendell Wilkie One World Flight Award. last August, in the middle of the monsoon season, a group of passengers gathered in the office of the China National Airlines in the center of Calcutta, India. We got there right after dinner, although our plane, bound for Burma and China, was not scheduled to leave from the airdrome 15 miles away until 4 the next morning. The idea was that curfew was on after dark. The only vehicles abroad at night were tanks and armored cars. For a week, Hindus and Muslims had been fighting a religious war within the city and already more than 3,000 had been killed. At midnight, our convoy left for the Dum Dum Airdrome. We rode slowly through deserted streets, passing an occasional burned-out house with embers still glowing. Every now and then, our headlamps picked up a corpse, or a group of them, lying on the highway. They had been there for days, decomposing under the hot sun and the steaming rains, The plane was late starting, and the passengers, Chinese, French, and two Americans, Lee Bland and myself, sat around drinking a warm chemical solution named lemon pop. There were no stars, no moon, no breeze, no traffic, no conversation. Far off on the horizon was a red glow which might have been burning houses. I heard a dog bark somewhere, distantly, and I thought about the dead lying on the dum-dum road. Whatever it was they started out to prove, it was still unproven. India was asleep. Four hundred million Indians, in their age-old poverty and misery, were sleeping another night through. Eastward, beyond the Bay of Bengal and the mountains and jungles of Burma which lay across our route, 400 million Chinese were sleeping under the same blanket of darkness and privation. With the coming of the new day, they would resume their huge struggle for existence. They, too, were fighting and killing each other. At five that morning, when we boarded the plane, tired and sweaty and hungry, I felt that all of us, the whole shebang, you and me and the hundreds of millions of war-weary Europeans and Africans and Asiatics, must be closer to Mars than we are to one world. After 48 sleepless hours, 18 of them in the air, we landed outside the brawling, overcrowded and fantastic city that is Shanghai. It was midnight. Nobody asked to see passports. With a dozen fellow passengers, we got on a bus, the only transport available, and rode into town. The driver stopped several times on the way to let people off and, incidentally, to help them find the right street and address and to chat leisurely with bystanders. Each of these excursions took from ten minutes to half an hour while the rest of us waited in the bus. It was now two in the morning. Bland and I were miffed, but the Chinese passengers, every bit as tired as we, were uncomplaining. 
It was a detail, infinitesimally small and unimportant, of the quality of patience in a people who for centuries have endured a great deal from those sitting in the driver's seats of China. A city to be noisier than Shanghai would have to be in a state of constant explosion. Here is a recording made on the Bund, the broad embankment along the Wangpu River near Sucha Road on a normal morning. One of the sounds you'll hear is from an American cruiser anchored in the Wangpu. The disorder of hundreds of coolies, rickshaw boys, the noise of buses, trucks and trams, of ships and shipping was topped at one point by the striking of noon on the famous customs house clock high above the Bund. In the midst of this hubbub, Bill Costello, CBS Far Eastern correspondent, and I stood trying unsuccessfully to get shy Chinese people to talk. The inflation, which in recent weeks has brought Gomentang China to the verge of economic collapse, was spiraling upward last August, and in the following recording, you get a glimpse of it on the surface. I noticed a man carrying a great wad of money in his fist, and I asked Costello uh, who I that was. I see uh, one man here with a fistful of money. What does he suppose that is, Bill? This fellow right behind you. He's probably a messenger for some commercial house who's been sent out to change money. Well, he certainly must trust the pedestrian to carry such a boodle of money openly in his midst. Well, actually, I've seen uh, about ten times that much. This ward, I would say, was about three inches thick. I've seen uh, messengers going down the street with uh, a double handful of, uh, of Chinese money. It would probably uh, stack up 16 inches high. Uh, I'd say that uh, a man could comfortably carry in his two hands about a thousand U.S. dollars, which would be uh, uh, the equivalent of three and a third million Chinese dollars. A young boy, about seven years old, came along carrying tea in a copper kettle. He was selling it per cup at a round figure. What are you selling? What are you selling, sir? What is it? It's tea. Tea? tea? Yeah. How much? Hundred dollars. Hundred dollars? Yeah. Prices were on that scale generally. They're much higher now. You could see a movie for 1,500 Chinese dollars, go to a concert at Chungshan Park for $4,000, and buy American shoes for $50,000. Shanghai's inflation was exceeded only by its congestion. To carry our equipment by jeep a distance of three short blocks in the center of Shanghai one day took us an hour and ten minutes. We were on our way to see the mayor, K.C. Wu, to ask him about that very subject. We found him in his office in City Hall, a short, young, jovial, round-faced man with horn-rimmed glasses and an American education. The mayor explained the acute housing shortage of the city and incidentally gave an estimate of population which would place Shanghai as the third city of the world. I estimate the Shanghai population will be uh, uh, just a little, be a little bit below five million. And then many houses having been destroyed during the war, so on the one hand, we get less houses, on the other hand, we get much more population. That's why we have this housing shortage. We discussed a whole series of problems common to Shanghai and the rest of China. Then I asked Mayor Wu what he thought about the future of peace. His answer made no reference to the fighting between Gomentang and communist armies a few hundred miles to the, to the north. Mutual distrust, he said, was the root of all evil. I asked what he thought the best remedy for this. His answer was general, and in this respect also typical of the statements of many leaders whom we were to meet in China. I believe that everybody should show his cards on the table. Everybody should play fair. That's what I, I'm trying to do here in Shanghai. Shanghai is a sort of international city. We get all populations. But I think that as a mayor of the city, we should do it this way. We should be fair to everybody. We should lay our cards on the table. We try to give everybody, no matter of whatever nationality, the same kind of protection and the same kind of rights. 
We left the mayor's office and headed back to the tall apartment hotel where we were staying, a building with the highly un-Chinese name of Broadway Mansions. In a few short blocks was cross-sectioned the cosmopolitan character of the city. Movie houses named Uptown, Rialto, and Paris, a Russian restaurant named Jeep, a sign in French, Fabrication des Caisses en Bois, and music streaming out over a loudspeaker in a record shop, boldly mixing Chinese and Brazilian. Shanghai, most assuredly, is not China, any more than New York is America, but in some ways it is fairly representative. There were 46 newspapers in the city when we were there, but none had much of a circulation. The common man doesn't read because he can't read, and he can't read because there are no schools for him. In this country, we take for granted all kinds of things which are beyond the wildest imaginings of hundreds of millions in a country like China. A child here is vaccinated for smallpox, diphtheria, scarlet fever, he goes to a public school. He has a park to play in and so forth. None of that in China worth mentioning. In American cities, we drink water from a tap. In Shanghai, you'd no more think of doing that than you would of swimming in typhoidal Suchow Creek. If a poor man in Shanghai is seized, let's say, with appendicitis, he either gets over it or he dies. In these respects, Shanghai is China. All of the attributes of medievalism, poverty, disease, ignorance squalor, are to be found side by side with wealth, education, art, and social refinements, all within small compass. This, at least, we observed in the three big cities we visited in Gomentang, China, that is, Gomentang as opposed to communist China, for there are two Chinas, and we did not get to the second. But within the limits of what we did see, there seemed to us a marked difference between the depressed classes of the Middle East and India and those of China. The Chinese seem to be relatively cheerful and purposeful, not happy about their lot, but not brooding either, not squatting on their haunches. Unless they are perniciously poor or actually starving, they indicate a sense of humor. They'll smile at you. They like a song. They express the basically sweet nature that comes through such popular folk tunes as this beggar's song, which we heard in Nanking. Among these people, as you'd suppose, there was little awareness of international issues. Unlike the Egyptians, whom some of you heard on this program last week, the city Chinese, at least, knew that the big war was over, but they were too absorbed with day-to-day -day problems to worry about veto power, Greek elections, or trouble in Palestine. Not even at the cultural level of writers, artists, and actors was there much concern. Mr. Hu Yiquan of the Guomintang's Central Cultural Commission in Nanking told me... In these days, the uh, life or the living conditions in China are so uh, difficult that many cultural workers can not think of anything else but their own living problems. They have very little time to spare to uh, think of international issues, which is not very uh, close to their own uh, life. I found, as I went about meeting people in the cultural field, that I could get no more than general answers to specific questions. At a film studio one day, I talked for hours with actors and directors, and somehow the conversation kept returning as though by gravitational force to movies. Miss Ching, a very pretty actress, spoke of her favorite Americans. Humphrey Bogart, Charles Boyer, and Gary Cooper. Shelley Lowe, a director, spoke of the Chinese film industry, which he said was in a bad way. Film production in China is difficult because we don't have enough raw materials and equipment, and actors have to work at a salary set by the government. About the boldest statement was that of a young musician whom I asked why so little contemporary music of other countries had been introduced to China. Well, I think you, you must put this, and, uh, this, uh, this question to our Minister of Education. 
Outspoken comment, either pro or con the Gomentang government, was difficult to get within the little of China that we saw. It was explained to me that liberals, who were against both communists and Gomentang, were having a hard time of it. A scandal during the time of our visit was the recent assassination of two leading liberal professors in Kunming. Both were graduates of American universities, non-communists, and outspokenly critical of the regime of Chiang Kai-shek, leader of the Gomentang Party. Liberals complained that they were caught in the middle, that without armies to back them up as the communists had, they were at the mercy of Gomentang extremists. On the other hand, leading communists enjoyed diplomatic immunity. At a reception for us in Nanking, arranged by the Gomentang Ministry of Information, communist representatives were invited. Yet, within this turbulent situation, there was considerable homage on all sides to the ideal of one world, as set forth by Wendell Wilkie five years ago in his book. Scores of people to whom we talked had either met Wilkie when he visited China or had known about him. I was told at least 50 times by proud Chinese that the idea of one world had ancient beginnings on their soil and had had the services of no less distinguished an exponent than Confucius. At the reception, for example, Dr. Peng Shi Pei, Gomentang Minister of Information, opened a program of speeches with an allusion to this fact. Mr. Corbin, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy that you arrived at our capital on the birthday of Confucius, who is the forerunner of the one world idea. And Dr. H. H. Kung, himself a descendant of Confucius, explained that the Chinese equivalent of the phrase one world had been in circulation for centuries, that it was a popular motto to be found among the most honored inscriptions on public buildings. The title One World, the title of the book One World, has been translated in Chinese, into Chinese, and the Kenxia Ikya, <coughs> which literally means one family under the heaven. The Chinese respect the motto one family under heaven, but unfortunately, as the world well knows, China is itself by no means one family. Of the two Chinas, the bigger, representing roughly two-thirds of the country, is under the regime of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, a regime which his enemies call a tyrannical dictatorship. The other, centering in Shanxi province, is in the hands of Chinese communists, whose regime the Gomentang calls equally bad names. The two factions have been fighting for years, and until recently the United States, through General Marshall, tried to mediate that mission failed. General Marshall explained the failure and placed the blame on both sides. Correspondents who had been in China for years and to whom we talked could not agree on who was responsible. I certainly was in no position to make a decent estimate as I did not get to communist-held territory and with the exception of two interviews with high communist spokesmen, I had little opportunity to meet Chang's enemies. Nor did I meet the Generalissimo himself. At that time, the machinery of mediation was still intact and the principle of seeking peace was given voice. Dr. Sun Fo, son of China's first president, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, and himself president of China's legislative yuan, said, I believe, naturally, that the Chinese government and the Kuomintang are really sincere about peace within China. I also believe that the Chinese Communist Party is also sincere about peace. For uh, there is no man in his senses who would want war and bloodshed. The chief spokesman for the communists in Nanking was General Zhao Li, a soldier and a statesman famous in Chinese revolutionary history. We interviewed him at his small crowded house on the edge of Nanking. Through an interpreter, he told us that the Chinese communists had welcomed the coming of General Marshall to China as mediator. He said that the early mediation was successful, but that Chiang Kai-shek had violated agreements and, by doing so, frustrated Marshall's work. He pinned the blame on the Gomentang and was equally critical of American aid to Chiang Kai-shek. I feel sure that the American people would never come to understand why, on the one hand, uh, the, or the American government is mediating in the dispute, in the China's internal dispute, 
On the other hand, it is rendering uh, all kinds of uh, war supplies and materials to, to aid one of the two opposing and uh, parties which are fighting against each other. We are willing, we are willing to cooperate with the American people, but we have to criticize the ironic part of the American policy. We welcome any action taken by the United States government that is in the interest of the Chinese people, such as the mediation um, in the dispute, over the dispute between the two Chinese parties and to establish peace in China. We merely criticize the wrong part of that policy, that is, to assist only one party, the Kuomintang Party, to enlarge the civil war. Ever since arriving in China, we had heard a great deal about the so-called executive headquarters in Peiping, 500 miles north of Nanking. The organization, set up by General Marshall, was a bold experiment in peacemaking, and we flew up there one day to take a look at it. Little did I think that our visit would cause a minor incident. Executive headquarters consisted of entire staffs in triplicate, Gomentang, communist, and American personnel for each post, operating under three commissioners. It served as a sort of fire brigade to put out smolderings wherever they occurred on the long incendiary front between Gomentang and communist forces. Thirty field teams, each consisting of three members, again American, Gomentang, and communist, were dispersed over a large area. Whenever trouble arose, a field team was sent at once to the area and remained on the spot until the situation was cleared up. Though the work of headquarters was naturally difficult, there was still hope for ultimate success at the time we were there. We recorded the three commissioners, Walter Robertson for the United States, General Chiang Kai-ming for the Gomentang, and General Ye Chen Ying for the Communists. Mr. Robertson, a handsome, graying man who has since returned to his private occupation of bank president in Richmond, Virginia, explained the American participation. The United States members of executive headquarters are participating as a third party in the role of mediator. This unique organization, an unprecedented operation, is being carried out by trial and error and is continuing through the sound judgment and willing cooperation of all the participating members. The recordings were made in Mr. Robertson's office, and the opposing Gomentang and Communist Commissioners chose not to be present while each other spoke. My questions, by prior agreement, were limited to the scope of positive accomplishments, principally whether the unity achieved at headquarters could be broadened ultimately to take in the whole of China, whether from their experience as Commissioners they had any higher hopes for the realization of one world whether they had a message for Americans. The Gomentang general, speaking through his own interpreter, said, Each time a program is resolved, we establish added precedent, which will one day be, be the basis for the uh, arbitration of disputes rather than resorting to armed conflict. I do not believe that executive headquarters as yet had the time to be accepted completely as a model because our principal problems have been primarily a military nature. However, I state plainly and sincerely that both our accomplishments and our mistakes will stand as a model in the world to come. General Ye, once chief of staff of the Chinese Red Army, began by saying that in the first months headquarters had been comparatively successful. This, he said, was mainly shown by the fact that civil war ceased in a large part of China. But at this point, General Ye, in his message to Americans, departed from the agreed area of discussion with a criticism of American policy. It was this which touched off the incident I spoke of. General Ye told his interpreter, The American mediation fails for two reasons. First, there are still few diehards in China who are not willing to see peace and democracy come to this country. Instead, they are always thinking of eliminating Chinese Communist Party and other democratic forces and maintaining Kuomintang one-party dictatorship. Secondly, the American government gave and still gives the Kuomintang land lease military supplies to enable Kuomintang to wage civil war. 
as well as use the American Navy and Marines to support aggressive Kuomintang troops in one way or another. Such one-sided help to the Kuomintang caused the failure of General Marshall's mission. We hope that the American government will change its present double-edged policy so that the Chinese people will have a chance to exert their own pressure to bring about peace. Mr. Robinson shook his head in protest while Ye was speaking, but he made no comment until the general finished. Then, deeply disturbed, he said, I, for one, am unwilling to sit here in executive headquarters and listen to an attack on my government in its role as mediator. While this was going on, the Gomentang commissioner had been summoned, and he protested. Both he and Mr. Robinson had the right to do this, since the law of executive headquarters was that any one of the three commissioners could veto anything. The Gomentang general demanded that the recording of the last part of General Ye's speech, to which you've just listened, be destroyed. Then it was agreed not to destroy it, but to strike it from the record because it might embarrass the work of executive headquarters. Subsequent to this agreement, of course, the spread of the Civil War, the open declaration of similar communist charges, and the abandonment of executive headquarters has placed Beiping's brave experiment in mediation beyond the pale of embarrassment and given to the material you've just heard an ironic place in the history of the single most effective attempt to bring a halt to China's internal conflict. In the meantime, China struggles on, not only in a war involving millions of troops on both sides, but with inflation and famine crushing the people of Gomentang, China, which is the only part of China that we saw. A friend of mine who was working for UNRWA, Mrs. Mary Munford, wrote me from Changsha in Hunan province, no one who has not seen a famine can imagine the suffering of mass starvation. Hundreds of people wandering, dazed and lost in the streets, many of them lying in the middle of the street, dying of dysentery, hobbling along with the most terrible leg ulcers covered with flies, the children with the most haunting, little animated skeletons looking old as the hills, the skin drawn back from their teeth, the Chinese themselves, not to see them. I suppose they've grown accustomed to the sight of human suffering. 2,500 years ago, China's great sage, Confucius, laid down some principles for one world. Minister Peng in Nanking summarized them for us one day. The whole world will be managed for the interest of the people. Men of virtue and talent will be chosen to govern. Sincerity will be adhered to, and good neighborhood will be cultivated. Employment for the able bodies, everyone will labor with one's strength, but not only with a view to one's own advantage. From the starving children of Hunan and the tombstones of the professors assassinated in Kunming, from the fresh graves of soldiers killed in this week's fighting, from all this to the bare beginnings of the world envisioned by Confucius 2,500 years ago is the vast distance China has yet to travel. And with it, of course, the world. For what happens in China, as what happens in any country, happens to all of us. <laughs> You have been listening to CBS playwright producer Norman Corwin, first winner of the Wendell Wilkie One World Flight Award, in the ninth of a series of broadcasts based on his recent 37,000-mile global tour. All recorded voices heard on this broadcast were transcribed in China. Next week at the same time, One World Flight visits the Philippine Republic. Tonight's musical score was composed and directed by Alexander Semler. Guy Della Chapa was associate director. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.